my name is Lavinia, this is Peter. Welcome to Games Made Easy. Today I'm very happy to teach you and give you some tips on how to play Betrayal at House on the Hill 3rd edition, designed by Bruce Glasgow and published by Avalon Hill. Betrayal is a little bit more complicated than your average gateway game, but it's well worth learning it. I always say I love Betrayal because it's like you and your friends are plunged into a Scooby-Doo episode or one of those 50s B-movies. It's a lot of fun. If you enjoy this video, consider subscribing and clicking the like button and the bell to get notified when I post new videos. It helps a lot. In Betrayal at House on the Hill, you play a fearless group of explorers investigating an abandoned, creepy old mansion. What could go wrong, right? Well, in this three to six player game, you first work together to explore this possibly haunted house and it changes you and your companions. Then at some random point, a player triggers a scenario called the haunt. That's when it all becomes a tad crazy. One explorer becomes a traitor fighting the other companions who now become heroes trying to stay alive. The game has 50 haunt scenarios and they all tell a different life and death struggle for survival, each with its unique victory conditions. To win, you need to complete your side's victory conditions first, either as a traitor or as a group of heroes. To set up the game, each player must start by picking an explorer. There are six of them, each with two sides. It's best if you check as a group uh, which characters you play so that the party is balanced. Each mini has two characters. So for example, she can be Anita Hernandez or Isa Valencia. We know her age, her birthday, her hobbies, and some unique facts about her. All characters have two physical traits, might and speed, and two mental traits, which are sanity and knowledge. The green number here is where you start at the beginning of the game, move the clip to mark it. If you take damage during the game, move the clip down. If an effect tells you to heal a trait, return the clip to the starting value in green. If the clip is already at or above the starting value, don't move it. During the game, you can gain bonuses that let you go higher from the starting position up to the maximum shown on your character board. You can also lose trait values. If a trait is at its lowest value, closest to the skull symbol and shown in red, it is critical. This is the lowest it can get before the haunt starts. However, once the haunt starts, if one of your traits gets to the skull, you're dead. Now, pick the character board you want, take its character figure and the character figure base that matches your color, and each player takes a player reference card. Once the party is selected, it's time to set up and build a house. Take the starting tile with the three rooms and you place it in the middle of the table. Then you add the basement and the upper landing sufficiently apart from the main tile. They all have this L symbol. Place all the Explorer minis on the entrance hall of the large starting tile. You're ready to start the exploration. Shuffle the other room tiles and place them face down in one pile. Sort out the omen, item, and event cards in three stacks. Shuffle them and place them face down for easy access. You have eight custom dies, just keep them close by. Set aside all the monster and various tokens, the number track and pointer. Also set aside the traitor's tome, the secrets of survival haunt books, and the monster and traitor reference cards. You only need them after the haunt has started. Finally, you have the scenario cards, which explain what you're all doing in the house and determine the haunt you will face later in the game. Altogether, you should review all five scenario cards and choose the one you prefer. Each card describes different characters' motivation and the type of haunt you will face. Then you return the remaining scenario cards to the game box. Now that you're done with setup, you can start playing the game. The player who starts is the one whose character's birthday is coming up next from the date you're playing the game. Your character's birthday is written on the character board. On your turn, you can take any of the following actions in any order. You can move and discover one room. You can trade item and omen cards and use them for special actions. You can attempt a die roll. And when the haunt starts, you can attack. Let me start by explaining how you move. At the beginning of your turn, your speed value shows the maximum number of adjacent rooms you may move through during that turn. Isa has a speed of five, so she can potentially move through five adjacent rooms, even if she loses speed during her turn. Rooms are adjacent if they have a connected doorway or lead to one another, like the ground floor staircase that leads to the upper landing. To access the basement, you need to have discovered specific tiles. This one here does not have two connected doors and therefore is not adjacent. Note that the entrance, the hallway and the ground floor staircase is one same tile, but it counts as three separate rooms. Note that you can move, take actions and move again. But as soon as you've discovered a new room, that ends your turn. 
let me show you how you discover a new room. So say it's Oliver's turn and he moves one and lands on this tile with a doorway and no room behind. He may move through it to discover the new room. There are three levels in the house, the basement, the ground floor and the upper floor. Now the back of each room tile shows you where in the house you can place that tile. If the name of the floor doesn't match, bury it, which is to put the tile at the bottom of the pile. Do this until it matches your floor, in this case the ground floor. Flip the tile over and connect it to your room. You only need to align one doorway of the new tile to the room you're in. If a doorway or window doesn't lead anywhere, then it's a false feature, a cupboard or an alcove, like here for example. If the only possible placement of the new tile seals off the floor, you have to bury it and draw a new one. If you can't place a tile without closing off the floor, adjust the tiles on that floor so that you can place a tile by slightly adjusting the house. Place your mini on the new tile and resolve any text on the tile that says when you discover this tile or when you enter this tile. If the tile has an event item or omen symbol, draw a card from the matching deck. Read it out loud and resolve any effects as instructed. For event cards, only read the italicized text and follow the instructions. If you need to make a trait roll, only read the result of your roll, then put the card at the bottom of the deck. For item and omen cards, after you've read it, place it face up in front of you. Also, after each omen card you draw, you must make a haunt roll. In my house, we keep track of the omen cards with the number track. Also, if you draw the final omen card from the pile, you don't need to roll, the haunt starts automatically. I'll explain the haunt a little later. For now, resolve the omen card you've just drawn and it's the end of your turn. You may also decide to end your turn without discovering a new tile. You're never required to take all your movement or to take all your available actions. I'll now show you how you can trade items if you have not already used their special action or attacked with them this turn. Once per turn, if you are on the same tile as another explorer, you can trade any number of items and omens with that explorer as long as you both agree to the trade. All explorers, once per turn, can use the items or omen cards that have this special symbol. Special actions are explained on the card and they're always optional. Unless otherwise noted, you can only take each special action once per turn. You can only take special actions with items or omens you had at the start of your turn. Some items and omens have effects that are always on. These are not special actions. Now I'm going to explain the different types of dice rolls and how to resolve them, starting with the trick rolls. If you have to roll for knowledge, sanity, speed or might, roll the number of dice equal to the current value in your trait. Sometimes an effect will simply tell you to roll the number of dice. That is not a trait roll and is not affected by the things that only affect trait rolls. Now, the other type of roll is a haunt roll. This one determines whether the haunt starts or not. To make a haunt roll, roll dice equal to the total number of omen cards drawn by all players. If the result is five or more, the haunt begins and the player who just rolled is the haunt revealer. To start the haunt, look at the scenario card you picked at the beginning of the game and the omen card you've just drawn. The number indicates the haunt you're about to play. It also tells you which player is the traitor, if any. All the other players become the heroes. They take the secrets of survival book and the traitor takes the traitor's tome. Some scenarios don't have traitors. In this case, all players read from the secrets of survival and you don't use the traitor's tome. The free for all haunts are the opposite and for those, you all read from the traitor's tome. In some cases, the traitor will be the player with the highest or lowest value in a trait. In case of a tie, the player closest to the haunt revealer in turn order is the traitor. If you don't feel like playing the traitor and if another player volunteers for the role, swap your minis and give the omen card that triggered the haunt to the new traitor. To set up the haunt, start with all the heroes, reading the introduction to the haunt to all the players. The heroes perform all of the setup steps in order. Then the traitor reads the introduction to the haunt to all players. The traitor performs all the setup steps in order. After that, the heroes and the traitor should go in separate rooms so they can't hear each other, discuss strategy, learn about special rules and read the details of the haunt. All that information remains secret until you use it and the other player asks about it. If the haunt mentions specific tiles, you can go through the tile stack to check what they are, shuffle it when you're done. The haunt plays pretty much like the first part of the game, heroes and traitors taking their turn as usual. 
But of course, you don't roll for the haunt anymore. You also have new actions like attacking, looting and obstacles. I'll start showing you how to attack. It's one of the biggest differences once the haunt starts. You can attack monsters and explorers once per turn um, with any item and omen card marked as weapon. Announce which weapon, if any, you want for the attack, as you can only use one weapon per attack. Remember that you won't be able to trade a weapon that you use later in the turn, nor can you use a weapon that you obtain this turn. Also, you cannot use a weapon uh, to defend against an attack. To attack, both players roll the number of dice equal to their might and the bonus of your weapon. The highest roll wins and deals physical damage equal to the difference in the two rolls. There's no damage in case of a tie. When you take physical damage, you can choose to distribute the damage as you please between speed and or might. But if it says you take speed damage, then it's speed damage. The same goes for mental damage. Now, if you take general damage, then you can pick from any of the four traits. You take damage by lowering the number of spaces, not by the numerical value. So here, two damage takes you to five, not to four. Sometimes an effect, such as a weapon, lets you attack with a trait other than might. This attack is the same as a might attack, except that you and your opponent both roll the indicated trait. If an attack uses sanity or knowledge, the loser takes mental damage rather than physical. Sometimes an effect allows you to attack with another trait than might. In this case, the opponent will roll on that trait. And if you attack with a mental trait, you inflict mental damage. Now, some effects in weapons allow you to attack at range into another room if you have line of sight. Two tiles are within line of sight if you can move from one tile to the other without changing direction or floor. There can be more than one tile in between them. If a tile is in line of sight, all characters, explorers and monsters on that tile are also in line of sight. Remember that this time, if you reach the skull, in any of your traits, your explorer is dead. Monsters typically do not die, they are stunned. When a monster is stunned, flip its token to the stunned side. At the start of its next turn, flip its token face up again and end that monster's turn. Some monsters are killed instead of stunned and if so, remove their token from the house. However, some monsters cannot be stunned. Do not flip the token if they take damage. If an explorer dies, tip the figure over and leave it on the tile. It's now a corpse and all his items, omens, and any companions stay with him in that room. Other explorers may take one item or one omen from the corpse once per turn. You don't need permission to take that explorer's stuff. And in some haunts, the traitors may have specific uses for the corpses themselves. Now, another big difference in the haunt is how characters move, starting with how characters act as obstacles to the opposite team. Like obstacles before the haunt, a room with an opponent costs one extra movement to leave. Stunned monsters do not slow heroes. Now, let's look at the traitor's cool special powers. And the traitor may ignore any tile's damaging effects. They do not take damage if they fall through the collapsed room or end their turn in the furnace room. The traitor must still roll for the mystic elevator and they will slide down to the laundry chute. But the traitor may choose to ignore event symbols on tiles. But if they decide to draw an event card, they must resolve it as normal. Also, in some haunts, traitors control monsters and the monsters move in their own way. Roll the number of dice equal to the monster's speed. That's their movement for this round. Only roll once per group of monsters. Monsters may always move at least one tile. And unless otherwise stated in the haunt, monsters cannot discover new rooms. They cannot carry an item, but they do have special powers. Monsters can move between the basement landing and the ground floor staircase as though they were adjacent. Monsters may attack using normal attack rules unless otherwise noted. Monsters attack using might. Like the traitor, monsters may also ignore damaging tile effects. If a monster uses a tile effect, they must roll dice for that effect. Once you've completed all your movement and actions, um, or you want to stop there, or you've discovered a new room, that's the end of your turn. It will be the player on your left to go next. The game continues clockwise to explore the house and play the haunt until one side completes the goals of the haunt. That is the end of the game. The winning side will read their if you win section aloud. Now, my tips to win at Betrayal at House on the Hill are stay alive. No, seriously. Uh, before the haunt starts, try to collect as many items as you can. Also score as many points on your traits because once the haunt starts, it will be more difficult. 
after the haunt, you can still explore and discover new rooms and objects. It's just not as easy as before the haunt. My next piece of advice I wish I'd had when I started playing, and it's when the haunt is revealed, it take your time. It's a trap to think that you have to rush into the haunt. Um, make sure that you discuss with the players what you're going to do. So it's a more enjoyable game. Also, don't forget to use all those items and special powers you've collected. If there's a conflict between the rule book and what it says on the card, follow what it says on the card. If you're still not sure, uh, decide as a group just to keep the game going. And that's how you play Betrayal at House on the Hill, a simple and effective cooperative game guaranteed to make an evening to remember. You'll see that every time you play the game, it'll be completely different because you'll have to adapt to your character, to the other players and to the haunt. It's great with three to six players, the more the merrier. If you've enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. And if you enjoy my content, uh, consider becoming a YouTube member, a patron, or buy me a coffee. The links are in the video description. And if there's a game you'd like me to teach, leave it in the comments. I'll definitely check it out. We'll make more games easy soon. Bye now.